historic places. I'm Danielle Porter, Director of Preservation Services at Historic Richmond. For those of you who do not know us, Historic Richmond is a nonprofit with a mission to preserve our diverse historic buildings, neighborhoods, and places, spark revitalization, and champion our distinctive architectural history. We particularly want to thank our wonderful sponsors, Dominion Energy and TCB Trust and Wealth Management for supporting our programs. Please note that we are recording this evening's program and it will at some point be added to our website, historicrichmond.com. In 2002, we adopted a new strategic plan which envisions a more vibrant, inclusive, and sustainable future for Richmond. Part of this plan is to highlight the relevance of historic preservation and design in addressing contemporary issues. At the national level, we have watched society grapple with issues of labor and workforce shortages, the affordable housing crisis, sustainability, and diversity and inclusion issues. We're using our lecture program to address these. Last month, we talked about diversity. How do we better tell our complex histories, how do we preserve the places that matter to all Richmonders? And if you want to know those answers, you can go on our website sometime soon, and uh, the lecture should be posted. <laughs> but tonight we're here to discuss affordability and preservation. The affordability housing crisis has swept the nation, including here in Richmond. Our, often preservation is accused of contributing to the affordability crisis, which is just not true. Look around Richmond and you'll see that much of our naturally occurring affordable housing is found in historic buildings, such as smaller, older homes or apartments above downtown commercial shops. Historic Richmond, as well as many other nonprofits, have been focused on ways to increase the supply of affordable historic homes. In 2017, we added affordability as a secondary component to our revolving fund and began a partnership with Project Homes to rehabilitate three houses in Southern Bargain Heights, which were all sold as affordable homes to homeowners at or below 80% of the area median income, and the land was donated to the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust. We recently launched a facade grant program that focuses on neighborhoods that were historically redlined and is intended to help existing homeowners with exterior restoration work so we can keep the neighborhood in the neighborhood and curb displacement. No single person or organization or policy is going to solve the housing crisis. crisis. Just like you cannot build a house with only one tool from your toolbox, we must all work together. So tonight, we will discuss organizations and policies that are working together to help increase the supply of affordable historic homes what role preservation can play in solving this problem, and address common misconceptions about what preservation is and does and how it impacts affordability. Our panelists this evening have been actively working to tackle these issues, and we can't wait to hear from them. So it's my pleasure to introduce, in the middle, Jacqueline Dreyer, who is the founder and principal of Mulberry History Advisors. As an architectural historian and urban planner, she specializes in historic designations, Section 106 advising, preservation planning, and organizational communication. Her work is guided by the belief that the built environment is a powerful tool for interpreting history, building equity, and creating a sustainable future. She also serves on Historic Richmond's Junior Board. Kimberly Chen at the end. Um, Kim has over 40 years of experience in architectural history, historic preservation, and urban planning. She holds degrees from the University of Virginia and Virginia Commonwealth University. She has worked for federal, state, and local governments, nonprofit organizations, and the private sector. She currently serves as the Senior Manager for Historic Preservation with the City of Richmond's Department of Planning and Development Review. Histor at Historic Richmond, we work very closely with Kim and our staff on a number of preservation matters. And Mitchell Denise. Mitch was appointed to the Commission of Architectural Review in 2019 as a citizen at large member. The bulk of his career has been in New Orleans, where he was born and raised. His real estate and construction career started in 2002, and he has spent years in affordable housing, supporting the recovery effort after Hurricane Katrina. 
He is currently the Director of Construction for the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust and resides in Northside with his two daughters. Historic Richmond has partnered with the Land Trust on several projects, some of which you'll hear about tonight. So now let's give our panel a warm Richmond welcome. So before we, what we're going to do, we're going to define a couple terms before we move into presentations by each of the panelists. Then we're going to have a discussion um, with some questions that I've prepared. And after that, we will open it up to the audience for more questions. Um, so Kim, do you have that microphone down there? All right. So I was hoping that the panel could talk for a moment, just kind of give the audience um, a definition for affordability, area median income, housing burden, and housing crisis. Okay. <laughs> this is a surprise we didn't know we were going to <laughs> define these terms. Um, well, sort of affordability and housing burden, I would say, are a bit one and the same. Housing burden is when you are spending more than 30% of your income for housing. Um, and I'm gonna, when I get up and talk, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what this looks like specifically in Richmond. Um, area median income is a, a term for defining uh, average income, and sometimes it's done by a city, sometimes it's done by a metropolitan area. So if you look at the median housing, in, housing income for Richmond, it is much lower than if you look at the median housing house in coal, bleh, household income for the entire uh, metropolitan area, which would include Hanover, Chesterfield, and Enrico. Housing crisis, um, I'm going to hand this one off to Mitch since he's the one that's really providing a lot of housing. So some of the reports that you uh, read out there, uh, just the Richmond region, we are close to 10,000 units um, as far as the need for affordable housing. In some areas it's much higher percent, but uh, did the hard work there, but I'll just add for affordability that one thing, and I think this is why we're doing this, but one thing that comes up when we talk about what is affordable housing is obviously the price point of affordable housing varies based on your income, your family size, and so that's why AMI, area median, median income, is important because when we start talking about, well, how are we defining who needs programs that are targeted, whether it's subsidized housing, whether it's um, housing lotteries or inclusionary zoning, we're often talking about people making a percentage of the area median income. So if it's $50,000 and you're making 50% of that, maybe you qualify for a particular subsidy program. And just one other term I'll throw out because I'm gonna say it in my presentation without defining it, is workforce housing. And that can be a little bit nebulous, but it's often talking about that sort of missing middle housing, it's folks who, they are fully employed, they might even be in what some people think of as, um, you know, quality government or community serving jobs, but they are not making enough money as a firefighter, as a teacher, as a healthcare worker, as a government employee to um, live in high possible cities. So that's how I'm going to use workforce housing. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we are going to move into three um, presentations before going into the questions, and I'm going to start with Jacqueline, and she will be talking kind of a, about an overview of affordability nationwide and what some other cities are facing and doing. And then we'll move to Richmond, who will focus. Sorry, we'll move to Kim, who will focus on Richmond, and then Mitch, who has some case studies. So, all right.
Okay, good evening, everybody. It's such a pleasure to get to talk to people in Richmond who are interested in what I think is an incredibly important topic, the intersection of these two uh, areas. And I don't have to reintroduce myself, and you all already did that perfectly, but I'm Jacqueline Rayer, founder and principal of Mulberry History Advisors. I live here in the city of Richmond. I'm a volunteer on the junior board. And exactly like Danielle said, I believe that the built environment is a powerful tool for interpreting history, for building equity today, and for creating a sustainable future. That said, historic preservation is not inherently aligned with, nor is it inherently opposed to affordable housing creation. So instead, those of us who care about historic preservation need to make our work part of the solution to the affordable housing crisis that we find ourselves in. So tonight, my role is to highlight a few um, examples of what's being done in other cities in the country, because in my work, I work across the country. So I would like to start with Milwaukee, because previously, I was a preservation planner for the city of Milwaukee. And Milwaukee and Richmond have some things in common. They lack some affordable and workforce housing options. They also both have high concentrations of distressed and often historic properties in certain areas of the city. So in Milwaukee, one of these is the Garden Homes Historic District, and those are the photos you see. These early 1920 homes were the country's first public housing project. They provided high quality housing to veterans and to other working class families. The neighborhood remains working class today. And since the 2008 housing crash, the vacancy rates in this neighborhood have soared. So when an affordable housing developer acquired 10 homes in the historic district, which has about 100 properties, so that's a significant percentage of the district, they proposed rehabilitating the historic houses and then leasing them as affordable rent-to-own properties. So at the city and the preservation department, we were thrilled. That's an excellent proposal. You're rehabbing the buildings, you're making them affordable and preserving that in perpetuity and bringing home ownership to people who might struggle to get housing of this quality. The proposed plans were very well conceived. But there was this sticking point of what's going to sound like a really small thing, and it was that these houses had rotting historic windows, uh, historic wood windows, and so the proposal for cost saving purposes wanted to remove the rotted windows and replace them with aluminum windows. So Milwaukee has a strict historic preservation law. The Preservation Commission never approves aluminum replacement windows where you once had wood. But in this case, Myself, my colleague, to us it was very clear that the benefit you were going to get from a human side as well as from a preservation side was going to be very great by allowing this incompatible, less attractive looking window type in what was overall a high quality rehab of these buildings and putting 10 new families into the buildings. It's going to benefit the families who come into the housing obviously, but it's also going to benefit the neighbors in the district because living in a neighborhood with a high vacancy rate has all sorts of negatives associated and correlated with it. And it's also bad for buildings because vacant buildings, unless they've been properly mothballed, deteriorate at a rapid rate. And these houses, of course, had not been mothballed. So we proposed in this special meeting that had to be called that the commission allow replacement windows in this instance and the commission agreed. So the rehabilitation of the projects uh, is now moving forward. So that's a great story. Like It felt very successful for us in the moment. But I think that what this teaches us is that we really need to reconsider our approach to laws, to zoning codes, and other building-related policies. Because Milwaukee's law makes it difficult to be flexible, even though, in this case, we were able to achieve the right outcome. Our preservation ordinances specifically should allow us to better account for human and community needs as a balanced approach to urban planning. And one example of another city that is doing this is Bozeman, Montana. They're actually in the process of overhauling their preservation ordinance in order to achieve these goals specifically. They want a very people-centered approach. 
So let's go over to Washington, D.C., which is well known for suffering from an acute lack of affordable housing. It has that high area median income, which obscures that there's really very significant income disparity in the city and in the region. And while working in preservation there, I observed without directly working on many approaches to combating this problem. So the first, which is exemplified by the photo on the left, is affordability by edict. There's uh, inclusionary zoning in DC, and that is a government mandated program requiring that most new and renovated housing projects set aside eight to 10% of the units to be rented to households making 50 to 80% of the, air, the family median income. And qualifying residents apply for these units in a lottery. Now, sometimes they're rentals, but sometimes they are also uh, for sale. So sometimes they're condos. And this program has created affordable units, but it has been heavily criticized that there are not nearly enough units to meet demand, that units are not targeted at the lowest income families, because when we're talking 50% AMI, those are not the folks who are mo tend to be suffering most acutely. When we look at 30% AMI and even lower, that's kind of the baseline level for um, subsidized housing programs. And so other criticisms include that there are loopholes for developers to avoid this requirement. And there was a very high profile case, and I think this has happened more than once, of developers building separate entr entrances for the IZ residents of the buildings. So then another approach to affordability is optional incentive. So this is you know, where it gets more fun. You're participating because you want to in these programs. Many developers make use of the Department of the Interior's Federal Rehabilitation Tax Credit Program. Some of you in this room are probably familiar with it. These federal tax credits for historic buildings are only available for income producing buildings, meaning multifamily rather than single family owner occupied housing. And that program specifically provides a 20% tax credit for qualifying projects, which are reviewed by the National Park Service and must conform to the Secretary of the Interior standards for the rehabilitation of historic properties. There's no requirement that the housing be affordable, but more than 2,000 units have been built in DC using the tax credit. And you can see that press release uh, eight years ago, they were saying more than 1,900. So federal historic tax credits can also be combined with other incentives to make them more powerful. That can include uh, low income housing tax credits, new markets tax credits, and state historic tax credits. And combining the incentives makes it easier to create housing that is going to be for, that is going to be priced below market. And that makes it appealing, it makes it feasible, and we see lots and lots of tax credit programs across the country that uh, create affordable housing, and those are what tend to attract politicians to the idea that preservation doesn't have to be the enemy of affordable housing creation, because those are easy to understand projects, they're appealing, and they're very attractive often these historic building envelopes. And then finally, one very specific program I want to highlight is the L'Enfant Trust's Historic Properties Redevelopment Program. And that's exemplified by this very glamorous photo of a house nicknamed Big Green on the right. So the trust is a nonprofit who historically they hold facade easements on properties. But several years ago, they also became DC's first nonprofit real estate developer with a primary mission of historic preservation. So they acquire very distressed properties, which they rehab and sell as workforce housing. And you can see this is the sort of building that, if most people acquired it, they would demolish because the price of um, rehabilitating it is higher than the fair market value. So the trust takes on historic rehabilitation that, like I'm saying, wouldn't be economically feasible for an individual or even a for-profit developer. And they do this with finances that come primarily from a revolving fund and significant grants. Homes are then sold to moderate income families such as teachers, firefighters, and healthcare workers. Now, to date, the trust has acquired six properties 
They've completed five rehabs, one is still in progress, and they've sold four of the homes. One of the homes is for sale right now. They are successful in preserving buildings that speak to history, repairing them, and affordably selling them. The buildings are made of quality materials like irreplaceable old growth lumber, you can see a ton of that, that might not otherwise be recycled and leave the material stream forever. But these projects are extremely expensive, they're very risky, and therefore they're difficult to scale. You know, the Trust has been doing this for, I want to say about eight years now, and they've done six properties because these are very intensive rehabs. Complications with the purchasing process can also slow, slow sales and exclude seemingly qualified buyers for the homes. So one takeaway that I have from studying DC's approaches is that there's clearly no single solution, even at the local level. You know, all these things are happening in a single city, and yet the housing crisis remains acute in that one city, not to mention across the country. There are diverse reasons that people continue to lack affordable housing, so we need similarly diverse solutions. We need to do all these things and more. So my last example is a little bit theoretical. Upzoning is not theoretical. It refers to changing zoning laws to make denser building legal. Think duplexes, triplexes, instead of single family homes. This is already happening in cities. You might have heard about uh, Minneapolis banning single family zoning and uh, Portland also making steps in that direction. But in those instances, the focus has been on building new. <coughs> With the right zoning laws and the right interior alterations, some historic properties can be converted from single family to multi family housing without requiring new construction. The mansions in Philadelphia's Tulpa Hook and Station Historic District were the inspiration for an article I wrote on this subject a few years ago that really got me thinking about this. So the mansion on the right here, which is 264 West Walnut Lane, was converted into a six-unit residence in the 1950s. But the way it's zoned actually prohibits multifamily housing. So either it was converted before that law went into effect, um, or it received a special, a special exception. But restrictive zoning like this means that most houses nearby remain single-family residences, like the large home on the left. Yet 264 West Walnut provides a blueprint for those seeking to densify the cities without sacrificing our historic buildings. Promoting these moderately dense developments through zoning may help reverse outdated national housing policies shaped by racial and ethnic discrimination, it offers different neighborhood character options, and it takes advantage of the embodied energy of these historic buildings. It's more energy efficient to house six families in one of these buildings than one, but also because we have retained the historic mansion, we're actually preserving the energy not only that would be required for demolition, but that would then be uh, required to construct a new house for the materials, for the construction itself. Now, I realize that many factors have to be considered when we're talking about upzoning. You're not going to upzone a whole city at once. You're not going to upzone everything indiscriminately. We have to think about how we're going to provide adequate municipal services to a place that suddenly could see a two-fold, three-fold, six-fold increase in residents. Planning for many needs simultaneously, therefore, becomes crucial. It may help ease or refute concerns about increasing low-density neighborhoods populations. Every neighborhood doesn't need to dramatically upzone to add considerable housing to a new city. So my thought is that creating a pilot program in a historic district that has large single-family houses and high residential demand would be a good first step in sustainably adding more housing to the historic places that need it most, like this neighborhood. Even allowing accessory dwelling units to be created from existing garages and carriage houses may help. This is permitted in a number of cities now, including D.C. So that's my review of some of the existing uh, policies and approaches to creating affordable housing in tandem with preserving historic buildings. And thank you.
Good evening. I'm Kim Chen. I'm a senior manager for preservation with the City of Richmond's Department of Planning and Development Review. And this is a relatively new position within our department, and it was created for the sole purpose of we've always kind of done preservation in sort of siloed areas with applying the Commission of Architecture Review or working with design overlay districts, but reviewing all of our other land use initiatives sort of outside of the preservation realm. And so my position was created actually three years ago to work within one of the DCAO's offices, but I was moved back to Planning and Development Review last year so that we can start including preservation across the board when we look at land use issues. So where preservation and affordable housing come together is kind of my world a bit. So I wanted to I wanted to share just a few statistics about affordability in Richmond. And for a, a family earning the median household income, and I believe this is for the metropolitan area and not for the city of Richmond. I think the city of Richmond is more in the neighborhood of $55,000, dollars $56,000 a year for a family of four. But in the city of Richmond, 22% of our population, or a little over 50,000 people, live below the poverty line. And even households earning this, it means that 75% of Richmond's households earn less than the median household income. What that also translates to is that the median home value in the city of Richmond is $320,000. which nobody earning the median household income in the city of Richmond can afford. I thought this was a, a really interesting set of statistics because what it shows us too is that in addition to there being a lack of affordable units in the city, there's also a major lack in diversity of housing in the city of Richmond. Almost all of our housing is single family residential. So there's there's not a diversity that uh, even you know co-ops or we really don't have a lot of condominiums in the city. There's just not much diversity in our housing stock. So the kind of the job of the city is to come up with policies to help address these issues. So in 2020, the city produced an affordable housing strategy for the city. And its major focus was on how do we address the underlying causes of poverty and, and lower incomes within the city. And it also addressed how do we produce more affordable housing, and particularly how do we produce more housing for the lowest echelons of, of the city's income strap, who the folks where we probably do need more subsidized. How do we deal with the homeless issue in the city, which is growing? Um, so that was the main focus of um, this plan. But in the meantime, the city has been looking at other ways that, that we can encourage uh, affordable housing. And one of them is with a, a density bonus. That if you create, a, say you build a 60 unit apartment building and you make a certain percentage of those units affordable, other restrictions can possibly be waived or maybe you get an extra story um, instead of being able to build a five-story building you get to build a six-story building so you can accommodate those extra units there are concerns about this process and it's still being reviewed that this actually may have an impact on 
historic properties because if one of the things, if it happens to be a historic or happens to be a historic building and you are seeking a waiver, you could have a negative impact upon that historic district or neighborhood. The other thing that we do have is an affordable tax abatement if you for rehabilitation. So if you rehabilitate a building and it includes a certain number of affordable housing units, you can get a bonus. One of the areas where I think that this policy needs to be looked at a little closer is that it doesn't include the potential for mixed use development, which would really help us in areas like Shaka Bottom and in Manchester and other corridors where we have old commercial buildings where we could do a mixed use, and that is ex excluded as part of this program. So the, the map that's up there, uh, what this is showing us is the darker the area, that's where the affordable housing units, it's, it's gradiated by affordability. So not too surprising, you know, the lighter areas, you know, both north and south of the river to the west are where our most expensive houses are located. Um, the east end and portions of north side and then large sectors of south side are where the more affordable units are located. Um, the map here takes our current historic policies, and the city only has one, and that's our city old and historic districts, where we offer some level of protection within designated areas. And those are shown on this map in the dark outline. The areas in green are national register districts in the city. And those, as was pointed out, if you're in a national register district, you can take advantage of state and federal historic tax credits, which is a plus. Um, but they really don't offer any you know, incentive for affordable housing necessarily, nor do they particularly protect a historic property. Um, if you spend your own money, you can go in and tear that building down. There's a little bit of a trigger of protection if you are using federal funding. And so the, the housing stock that is in these darker kind of orange and, and red neighborhoods are mostly post World War II, you know, modest uh, colonial revivals, you know, small frame structures, buildings that we might not necessarily think of as being historic. Um, and so how do we protect those? And these are buildings that um, Donovan Ripkema, who's a preservation and economic development authority, um, Guru, I think some people probably put him up in some kind of holy stratosphere someplace. Um, he has said that this, this is our affordable housing. And this is the stock of housing that we need to be protecting moving forward. So what's the city doing? Well, one of the big things that we are doing is we are starting a process of reevaluating and rethinking our zoning ordinance. And one of the thing, and part of that is we are now doing a citywide analysis of neighborhood character. So that we can sit back and go, the fan is mostly, you know, two-story, semi-attached brick row houses. Um, Churchill has this character. Harbor has another character. Northside has a different character. So that we can start understanding what the built pattern in our city is. Um, so that's one thing that we're doing leading up to looking at our zoning ordinance and starting to codify some of the things that need to be codified so that we don't get, this is, both of these examples are from a neighborhood called Washington Park that is not listed on the National Register, it is not a city owned and historic district, it has absolutely no protections whatsoever. Um, and what is happening there is historic housing in the neighborhood is being torn down and 
replaced with building that is not necessarily physically compatible with the character and quality of the neighborhood. So we're looking at, you know, maybe a demolition. We can't completely say you can't demolish your property, but at least a break check. Let's sit down and talk about it. Let's see if there are other uses for that building. Let's see if there are other ways to use that building within your development scheme. Um, that's going to be a long process, but I think what you will start seeing as we develop these kind of neighborhood profiles, that we will start doing some smaller zoning rewrites within some of our more critical neighborhoods. And then one of the other things that we've just recently completed is there's always a lot of criticism that historic preservation or historic designation causes all of these negative things to happen in a neighborhood and causes people to be displaced. And what we found in, in doing this city or doing the study for the city was that there are so many factors that influence and affect the value of real estate. Location, improvements, the supply and demand, market demand, zoning, surroundings, local and national economic conditions, business cycles, actions of national, state, and local governments. There are so many things that go into what triggers or causes values in neighborhoods to rise. And so we looked at a variety of, of neighborhoods and we looked at areas that were both city old and historic and national designation. We looked at things that were only one. And then because all of our city old and historic districts are also national registered districts, <laughs> makes it easy. So we looked at areas that were one, we looked at areas that were just national register districts and then we looked at areas that had no designation at all and what we found was when we looked at changing the number of uh, building permits all sorts of things the, the distribution was pretty even across all of these types of districts um, and and pretty similar across the different areas or impacts that we, we analyzed. So we found that it really didn't particularly matter whether some place was, was both, was one, or was, was neither. And part of it was that we also looked at how the city used to have a tax abatement program that could be used for rehabilitation anywhere in the city. Um, if you were in a national register district, it got reviewed. If you were in a car district, it got reviewed. But the rest of the city, you got an abatement for doing a rehabilitation, but you could, um, you didn't have to follow any rules or guidelines for getting those funds. And we found that that was used, you know, extensively and, and used across the city regardless of whether an area was designated or not. And then the other thing was that we looked at the use of historic tax credits, state and federal tax credits, which is tied to an area being designated. And what we found was that that distribution of the use of credits was, was all over the place. It wasn't you know, evenly distributed across uh, state and federally listed historic districts. Um, but if you'll notice, it's mostly concentrated around the central business district. So, it's probably driven by location and not necessarily driven by whether it's, you know, a historic neighborhood or not. Um, so that's what the city's working on. Um, and we will keep everybody posted as we proceed. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So these next uh, next homes I'm going to be showing you are homes that um, we've worked on in the past. Uh, I'll try to tell you a funny story or two about them. Um, all the stories, or the houses, 
I'm going to throw out some of these terms and terminologies, uh, such as you know, Section 106. That's a historical review. All of these homes that we we rehabbed and went through a historical review. Some of which Kim did. <laughs> Uh, we also used some historical tax credits on some of these projects. Uh, went through the process with DHR, who reviewed uh, a lot of these homes as well. Uh, we used all kinds of sources, such as uh, CBDG funds, community development block grants. Uh, we go through soil boring, RHA, and uh, the CLT. All of these are kind of say financial tricks or creative financing um, that we've used in the past to get some of these houses done. All of these homes too were done affordably and I believe all of them are uh, owner occupied 80% and below, 30 to 80% below. Um, at, when I was with Habitat we did a lot of these and the majority of them wound it up at 56% AMI. And that's a person that makes right around, at the time, a little under 30 grand, whole household. So these were fun. Um, this was uh, about 70 homes that we did. Uh, I said we, it was us and Project Homes. Uh, we did it in phase one and phase two of RRHA Homes. Uh, we could do these affordably because we were awarded the RFP from RHA and these homes were sold to us for a dollar apiece. Um, these homes, many of them, as you see, are moved from their original site. I, I can only imagine how much like real dollars these houses cost. They were built, many of them, in the 40s. They were moved and rebuilt in the 70s, and then we rebuilt them in the 2020s. So um, I'm really stretching the definition of affordability. Um, anybody can tell me where that is? Yeah, good job. <laughs> and so here are some of the homes uh, that we inherited and bought. Uh, this one on the bottom right that shows rehab, that's on the north side. That's one of the more historic homes. We had homes that ranged in age from the 1910s to the 1970s. Um, when we got these homes, I came on in phase one of the homes was Habitat. Uh, when we were awarded phase two of the homes, I went to RHA, and I'm like, look, we want to go into these homes and see what we have, see what the historic stuff that we could salvage and what kind of conditions those are. They're like, no problem. Yeah, go in there. Um, all right, so uh, sign, hold, harmless, agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, okay, so where, where can, can we get the keys? They're like, oh, we don't have any keys. That guy quit six years ago. <laughs> so for two days, we broke into all 17 of our homes <laughs> to see. Um, and so maybe, maybe Danielle, that could be the next lecture, how to break into historic homes. <laughs> this next home is in Etra. That's about as far down in Chesterfield as you can get. Um, some of the interesting things about what is called the Hathaway House is, you know, it was built in, from our research, between 1830 and 1840. Um, very, very old home. Uh, we believe, from our research, that this was a home for some of the managers or workers uh, that worked on that industrial part of the river in the Appomattox. So, in essence, this was an affordable home pre-Civil War that we turned back into an affordable home. This house was a complete mess and disaster. Um, we inherited, bought, you know, I, I don't know what you want to call it, but this was owned by and bought through CBG funds with uh, the Virginia Habitat affiliate. 
And so they reached out to us. They're like, we don't know what to do with this house. Can you, can you, can you possibly take a look at it? So, so we did. Um, we had to throw away about the back two thirds of the building. Um, it's kind of neat to where the main part of the building, the oldest section of the building, you can kind of see how the family grew. It went out to the right, then we had another add on in the back as the family grew, and then uh, we got some, um, we, we could do indoor plumbing, so we put another addition on it, and then we finally did another addition. So working with DHR and trying to marriage all of these additions and still try to get some type of decent, affordable house was, uh, was pretty tricky. The oldest parts of the building had the whole pin and mortise joints still intact. The, the old sill beams and stuff were 10 by 12 pieces of trees. Um, but the, the, the add-ons, the additions, is what really were problematic. And so between Habitat Virginia donating this property to us, them using CBG funds, us using volunteer labor, we were able to save this and turn it into this. Some of the interesting parts, uh, and that's the original mantle, um, we were able to save the original hardwood floors from the first and second level. It had like a sleeping quarters upstairs in the original thing. Those boards span the entire width of the, uh, the old section. The final house is Probably the best example of what can possibly be repeated and save more historic homes while pro uh, possibly providing affordable housing. Pay special attention on how low that house sits compared to the sister houses next to it. This is uh, houses that consist of five little sister houses. Uh, they're you know all the same floor plans. Um, and so this house, another another wreck. Um, Kim helped us out on this one. Uh, through some research, we realized that this house, uh, extremely unlevel. The front right of the house was the high point. The back left of the house was the low point. It was 23 and a half inches out of level. So what in the world do you do and, and how does that happen? Well, through the research, we believe this house and all those houses uh, sit on Bloody Run Creek. Um, we went through there, did soil borings, and the soil borings, we went down 35 feet um, before we found like any decent dirt. The soil borings uh, are, consist of, it's a four inch tube. You drill it into the earth and you come up and to send that soil off to some lab that's going to tell you what type of consistency or what kind of weight you can put on that thing. Um, there were some tubes that went out about 20 feet deep that when you opened up the tube, it was just water that would come out. So the creek's still running. <laughs> uh, what did we do? This is the type of condition this house was in. You can see from the window that window is in the bathroom, supposed to line up with the house across from it. It's a little off center. You can see the type of, and how close everything is. The, the, no one would have been, you know, this, this house could, would, would have been understood by even the worst of preservationists to like, go ahead and tear it down. More ugly pictures. So we went in there, and it's a little bit complicated, but the, the math and stuff is very simple. We went through there and did basically steel pilings. You go through, and with a apparatus, you push these down hydraulically into the ground in five-foot steel piling sections until you can't push anymore. And when you can't push anymore, you know exactly how much weight that piling can Hold. We did this 27 times around the foundation, 
until we were able to put these ledges under there. What you're seeing there is the old chain wall that's on top of the brick that has been lifted out of the earth. Um, so we started raising um, and until we couldn't raise it anymore because the brick on top of the chain wall started falling apart. So what did we do then? After we stabilized the entire chain wall, and I know there's, there's a point to this, where <laughs> we, we stabilized the chain wall and then we lifted the house off the foundation and put brick in there to get it level. We got it within a quarter of an inch. That's kind of the tubes lifting everything out. That's how it sits today, higher than the other houses. Um, we did all this uh, using all these creative finances, using the CLT model, using you know every tool that was out there, and it was bought by a young school teacher in her first house. And uh, if you're wondering, I would never buy a house like that. I don't know what that foundation is going to be. It comes with a lifetime guarantee. Um, and so this is, this is a case where a house in its worst condition, we still made a little bit of money on it. Um, it took cooperation with the city because we got it through a tax sale. It put cooperation with the land trust who bought the land cooperation with all the historical tax credits that we then sold to, you know, a, a person um, that were friends with Habitat at the time. And uh, we were the first nonprofit to do a historical tax credit with a single family residential home. So that's the way it sits now. Some pretty pictures. The nice thing about this house is everything in the house, even though it was in that deplorable condition and everything was racked and stuff like that, all the windows remained, all the trim remained, all the doors, everything that you see in there, um, besides patches and whatnot, it's all original. Obviously, the kitchen's not original. Really. It turned out nice. So it takes a lot of partnerships, but these are. At least some of these houses, maybe some of the most not historic ones, right? But all of these are older homes, preserved in an affordable manner. Thank you. project. We'll, we'll see if I can pull this one off. We're going to save the facade, and so I'm pushing the boundaries of what the definition of a historic home not only is, but what we can do. Um, the facade looks to be in good shape, and that's the guy. <laughs> But there's also the fact that depending on what community you're in, 
there are people who think preservation is going to ruin the value of their home because the restrictions on what you can do to it will lower value. And then there are people who think, well, it's going to gentrify the place that I live, and I'm going to be priced out either through property taxes or through rent. And I do think one problem that we have with preservation is that we don't have enough studies to really show people what's going to happen where they are. Studies have been done, and there's a variety of conclusions from studies based on the methodology, based on the place you're studying. There's a study that says it does slightly lower property values. There's studies that say it slightly increases. They're never too dramatic. Um, there are studies that say it stabilizes property values because people understand what they're getting in the community they live in. They understand that um, houses aren't going to significantly increase in size next to you, so your light and air isn't going to be unexpectedly encroached upon. But we don't have the kind of data where we can say to people, okay, based on the situation in your city or in your neighborhood or your part of the neighborhood, this is what we think is or will happen. And so it's very hard to engage, I think, sometimes. And that's why the work that the city is doing and, and trying to look at like, what has happened over time with prices of neighborhoods and correlation between designation and not is so important because people want to know that. And we can't, we can't always engage with that, I think, fully and to people's satisfaction who are coming into it. I'm just going to add one more thing. Having taught historic preservation at VCU for 10 years, I personally think that the whole term historic preservation is antiquated and needs to go away. Um, I think it has, if you look at how the whole historic preservation movement started and kind of where we are now, it was a very elitist activity. Um, the only things that were being saved and protected were the best of the best. Um, the first historic preservation action in the United States was to save Independence Hall. The second one was to save Mount Vernon. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a term that has, it's kind of outlived its usefulness. And I think what we really need to start thinking about now is, and the city has just launched a new we're going to be doing a citywide, and I'm going to use the bad term, historic preservation plan, for lack of another name to call it. But what we're really looking at, and kind of what I hinted at that the city is looking at citywide, is how do we how do we save and protect our resources? How do we save and protect those spaces and places that are important to the city, that, that make the city not Chesterfield County, that make the city not Charlotte, um, that make us unique and special and, and add meaning to, to what we are as a place. Is that cultural resource management? Is that neighborhood conservation? Is that, I don't know what that term is that we're gonna hit on, but I do think that it's time to say goodbye to the, the term historic preservation. Thank you. These photos are mostly just or fun, um, so that you have something different to look at. But this one, these were three of the houses we did in Southern Garden Heights with Project Homes and the Land Trust. So they were all rehabbed and sold to people that are below 80% AMI. Um, so just want to just want to let you all know that. <laughs> yeah, a little plug. Uh, so how would you respond to a homeowner who wishes to make changes to their house but feels like the restrictions in place by a city old and historic district make it unaffordable? I guess this one is mine. Who's the secretary to car? Um, we try very within the CAR guidelines and the CAR system to work with property owners to find affordable solutions. And we have partnered with other organizations to find, you know, we've actually done in the Union Hemel and Historic District, we've done three affordable housing 
rehabbed the project homes. It didn't drive their prices up. We worked with them to find you know, alternate materials, alternate ways of doing things so that the houses still met their needs to provide affordable housing. So my response would be, come in, sit down, talk to us, and we'll figure out a solution. Um, we've done some emergency repair programs with Habitat and with Project Homes in City Oakland Historic Districts, um, where we have figured out how to make those repairs with an elderly property owner and, and make them work within whatever Habitat or Project Homes budgets work. So we can be flexible. Thank you. I'll just add a, a few things. Um, some of the projects that I've worked on, both in New Orleans and Richmond, have had, uh, if they are old and historic uh, in those districts, or they are made to this in those and some of the products that have allowed that house to be preserved, I think we all know that their the old growth lumber is not around, right? Um, so how do you combat that. One of the ways that we've done it in the past, at least with Habitat, is to have a, as we hold up our own mortgage, is to have a separate repair escrow for that. So there's little tricks you can do uh, because it, it does become problematic if the homeowner is in a historic structure that does not have the financial means in which to maintain it. But there's tricks out there. Okay, so that, that touches on another question that I have. Maybe that's the answer. But are there ways to mitigate the cost burden of home ownership beyond kind of what we've been discussing and then holding the maintenance repair from the mortgage is an interesting... It, it can, can help with the solution. Um, you know, we at CAR are working on, um, you know, trying to find, you know, compatible substitute materials. Um, at times where we, I'll just throw it out there. Some of the, like with Richmond Rail, this is where I got on that um, kind of train of thought. The Richmond Rail that you buy today is not the Richmond Rail that existed, you know, 100, 150 years ago. And I cannot find any materials like that. So if we're gonna be good stewards to these properties, to these buildings and whatnot, and we know we're throwing stuff that is not going to last and it's going to need to be constantly maintained. Um, we're exploring different areas. Thank you. All right, so the way we build and plan cities has changed over the decades, and older urban neighborhoods look very different from newer neighborhoods. Her shell looks very different from short home. Are there opportunities for affordable housing available in older building stock that are not available in Well, I think like with the 805 um, Chimborazo uh, case study example, we built it. It took a lot of different partnerships with the city, with the state, federal um, monies. Uh, but there are examples where that thing could possibly be replicated is because it takes the same amount of able to do 805 Chimborazo as it does to do some of these older looking warehouse uh, properties where you might be able to put a hundred units in. Places like Petersburg where they have old historic districts and they have the stock which is in some areas blighted also. If you pair all those things together and you're willing to do and take on the headache of doing all that paperwork, those are 